Thanks for tuning in to the Move Mind podcast. This episode, we are going to talk about more to do with strength and conditioning for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Specifically, this episode, we're going to talk about the concept of maximum recoverable volume and also maintenance volume. So these are two key principles and kind of ideas which I first came across through reading and listening to sort of YouTube videos from Dr. Mike Isretel, um, made famous, I guess, from the Renaissance Periodization Crew. I think that's his company. Um, he also does BJJ. I think he's a purple or a brown belt. Um, he's pretty yoked. He's a smart guy and he trains hard and he understands a lot to do with exercise physiology. And then also Chad Wesley Smith, who runs Juggernaut Training Systems. He's also a purple belt now, I think, as well. And he's got some interesting ideas around this MRV, or what we call maximum recoverable, recoverable volume. So that's the goal of today's episode, really, is to understand why does it exist, you know, what is it, why is it important for grapplers, and how can understanding that principle help us with ultimately balancing jiu-jitsu and a strength and conditioning program, as we talked about last episode, which is the whole reason for doing an SNC program, is to reduce time spent away from the mats due to injuries. So trying to build some kind of robustness, resilience, and a good sort of foundation level of general preparation so that we can ultimately do jiu-jitsu more. That's the main goal, to get better at jiu-jitsu. So let's get stuck into it. I wish I knew this principle earlier. I have juggled with balancing, lifting, and jiu-jitsu for the last five and a half years. And it's been a great journey and I've loved it, but I wish I came across this idea of maximum recoverable volume, or I'll abbreviate to MRV for the rest of the show. I wish I found out about it earlier. It would have saved me a lot of sort of burnout slash overshoots, which we'll get into later as as to how that can happen. So what is it? What is maximum recoverable volume? So if you think about training, any kind of training, especially lifting, training in the gym properly, it comes at a temporary cost. There's an energy cost there. It takes energy to go and do that training session. We need fuel to do that. And then for anywhere from kind of eight to 72 hours, depending on the session and what goals we're after, we need to recover so that the next time we come in, we can do it again or have a slight variation on it or do it again a little bit harder. And we'll get into why all that's important later. If you think about jiu-jitsu as well, training on the mats at jiu-jitsu also comes at a temporary cost. So fatigue, getting tired from sparring, the toll on the body from clashing into other bodies, and contact, contact sports take their toll. There's an energy cost there and a physical cost too. So training costs energy. For both jiu-jitsu and for strength and conditioning, there is a maximum recoverable volume for you, um, which is probably unique to you. So what is MRV? The maximal amount of training volume, or what we will call work, that a person can perform in either a training cycle, a training session, or in an actual exercise, and still recover from fully in order to adapt and progress further during the next training cycle, training session, or exercise. So it's your the maximum amount of training that you can do and still recover, okay, and go forwards. Now here's where it gets interesting with jiu-jitsu and lifting, and I've experienced this. Very often people will say, oh, it's actually quite hard to overtrain just purely lifting weights. And I would agree, if you're following decent programming, overtraining just for lifting is actually quite hard to do. But overtraining, mixing jiu-jitsu, specifically drills and sparring, and lifting together, I've actually found it's quite easy to overshoot. And I'm talking here from personal experience on a volume kind of level of five to six jiu-jitsu sessions in a seven-day period, and anywhere from four to seven lifting sessions in a seven-day period. And that's where I felt that I've overshot. So what happens if you overshoot the calculated MRV, your own MRV kind of figure? Well, basically, you don't adapt properly. 
And in order to hit the next training cycle or training session fresh and adapt to that, you have to be training at your actual MRV level or slightly below, but you can't overshoot it. Because if you overshoot it, the adaptation doesn't take place. And then the, the following sessions become more and more of a waste until you just can't complete them anymore. And you get what we kind of call burnout or you've overtrained. And then there's no adaptation is going to come. And usually something like, you know, you get sick or your immune system is feeling a bit busted. You're very tired, low in energy, and you're sort of forced to stop. And I felt that quite a few times. So let's take an example. Normally you hit three to five takedowns in sparring at your BJJ class. You squatted heavy on Monday, but you're so sore now, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can't even do a single takedown in the class. And so, for one reason or another, you've overshot that MRV figure for yourself. You're having a negative BJJ performance at class, a negative BJJ practice, due to the fact that you haven't recovered from the training on the Monday gym session. And if we take the general principle that we're following and agreeing on that jiu-jitsu takes priority, well then something's wrong. If you can't then go and hit that kind of number of takedowns or whatever your equivalent figure, your equivalent metric of a good jiu-jitsu training session is, of which there's plenty of different ways to measure that. So, you know, taking that above example with the squatting there, it's a number of reasons as to why you overshot. It could be that the programming was awful, that you were following some kind of small of training program or some horrendous squat program designed for people on roids or whatever it is and you've just damaged your muscles so much you can barely sit down and take a shit you know without shedding a tear that kind of thing it could be that you had poor sleep yeah, that's a big indicator when sleep goes down training quality goes down and you're not recovering as much could be poor nutrition i think the younger you are the more you can get away with shit food but the older you get i think it does play a bit of a part it could also be that you weren't following the training program properly. The program might have been fine, but you didn't follow it. When it said go medium, you went balls to the wall. You know, So it could be that you're not following the sort of sets, reps or rest time as indicated. I'm certainly guilty of that myself in the past too. So overshooting when you do jiu-jitsu and lifting, I think is real. So it's a good idea the newer you are to lifting and jiu-jitsu or, or both, to understand how to prevent that. Because you're just going to get more out of both lifting and jiu-jitsu ultimately. So let's talk about then ways that you can actually hit your MRV properly, just below it or bang on it. So let's flip that round, let's invert that and think about what do you actually want to avoid doing also known as common mistakes that either new lifters doing BJJ do, new people to BJJ do with an experienced lifting background, or they're new to both lifting and BJJ. These are common mistakes. So performing a program in the gym that is actually designed for powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, toss fit, whatever it is, it's not designed for SNC for Jiu Jitsu. Okay. If you go and follow a powerlifting program and try and grapple five to six days a week without using steroids, you are going to overshoot pretty quickly. Last summer, I got away with nine weeks of lifting six to seven days a week, six days on average, and training jiu-jitsu six to seven days a week, six on average. I managed nine weeks and then I burnt out because I wanted to de deliberately break some rules and experiment and see where I was at. For the record, that was a Bulgarian-style influenced program based around trying to increase the weight I could lift in a back squat. Okay, <laughs> Not applicable to jiu-jitsu really whatsoever, but to strength training, very applicable outside of jiu-jitsu. So I was kind of breaking some rules there, seeing what I could get away with. 
don't recommend it. <laughs> well, I do recommend it, you know, try these things on yourself, but I don't recommend expecting to get beneficial results doing a Bulgarian-inspired squat program and trying to grapple all the time. Something's going to give at some point. There will be diminishing returns, so nine weeks for me. So don't perform programs that aren't designed for grapplers, basically. Take ideas by all means, but there is a reason programming for powerlifting is for powerlifting. There is a method to that, okay? On the kind of other side of the same coin, performing a cookie cutter program, right? So that's got, you know, you can buy these online. They're sort of made one size fits all. And they're not applying any scrutiny on your behalf. So not adapting it to what you know about yourself. Maybe you don't know anything about your own training. But following a cookie cutter program, these kind of templates, it's pretty easy to, to get um, swept away. Again, you're at the mercy of the programming of this, this coach or whoever it is. Most of the time it's not even coaches. It's just influencers and whatnot. Um, I will do some reviews on the programs I have done, which are cookie cutter, I can't get that out, and sort of tell you my insights of the ones that I've followed. Wrestler's Edge from Carmen Bot, Submission Strength, PJ Nestler, and Roll Strong, I think it's called, from Phil DeRue. So I can go through kind of my own reviews and experiences with those in future episodes if, you, if you'd like to hear about that. Um, but you've got to, again, you know, to go back to that point, you have to scrutinize those programs just a little bit to understand, you know, okay, well, here it says, you know, squat heavy for exercise one or whatever it is. You had a massive sparring session the night before, six, seven rounds, averaging at a four out of five, you know, 80% intensity, and you're bagged. Does it make sense to do that heavy squatting? Should you adjust that? You see what I'm saying? Uh, getting a program from a from a fitness influencer as well comes in a similar kind of, you want to avoid that similar category. What even is a fitness influencer? I don't know, but I can guarantee they won't have much of a clue when it comes to getting a program for sporting performance, specifically for BJJ and grappling sports. Another thing that you probably want to avoid is performing a program that was designed for different contact sports. So whether it's rugby, hockey, lacrosse, American football. There's similar traits there with those sports. You know, they're all contact sports with grappling. But there are sporting demands that are specific to jiu-jitsu and there are sporting demands that are specific to, let's say, rugby. So when you carry out a needs analysis for jiu-jitsu, you will see that there might be a lot of similarities as what a BJJ player needs and a rugby player needs, but they're two very different sports with very different rule sets. And it's those minutia of the rule sets which will dictate the special preparation period, if you like, the period closer to competition, what kind of stuff you're doing in the gym. At that point, you don't really want to be following stuff from a rugby training program necessarily, right? You want to be following a program that's good for jiu-jitsu. Another error that you probably want to avoid when it comes to hitting your MRV or staying just below it is performing a program that's got like 10 different exercises and takes you know over an hour and a half to complete. Like, What is the point? You know how exhausting an hour and a half jiu-jitsu class can be. Why would you want to be doing resistance training for an hour and a half and beyond you know, as a hobbyist, as an athlete, that's one thing. But as a hobbyist, you know, with a day job, good luck. I, that's that's going to be, a, again, another kind of quick route to burning out and overshooting your MRV figure. So that's a couple of ideas around what you want to avoid. And then there's obviously what you do want to do. Okay, and these are all kind of household terms now, the recovery methods. But good sleep, good nutrition, staying hydrated. Easy to do, but still difficult to maintain, I find. Try and have a low lifestyle stress. You can do steady state cardio for recovery too. You know, single modality, long walks, fast walks, slow jogs, sitting on the static bike, sitting on the rower, 
light assault bike, whatever it is, you know, 30 minutes, heart rate 135, 140, that kind of stuff. Those things you can do to assist with recovery, so to speak. So what is your maintenance volume then? So we talked about MRV. If you like, MRV is kind of, think of it like a, an empty glass. It's how big the glass is, okay? A full glass would be your maximum recoverable volume. But if the glass is overflowing, you've overshot, right? So that's the top end of the ceiling, if you like, the, the far end of the parameter goalpost that's set. So what about maintenance volume then? Well, maintenance volume, it's just as important as maximum recoverable volume because we can define this maintenance volume as the minimum amount of training that you can do and not regress, but actually maintain the qualities that you have built up to that point. So what's the least amount of training you can do and not go backwards? So this is the kind of the other end of the goalpost and this would, you can kind of think of this as what's the minimum amount of liquid in the cup that you need to quench your thirst, so to speak, right? Your needs to adapt to your strength and conditioning training. There's a minimum amount you've got to do and there's also too much and there's a just right. Okay, so maintenance volume is important. So if your jiu-jitsu class that day was brutal and you've got a lifting session booked in on the same day, if you know your maintenance volume, you know that after you've warmed up in the gym, how well that training session is gonna go or if you should just take that session off altogether. If your maintenance volume is clear in your head, maybe you just go in, you warm up, and you just do the first lift, first few warm-up sets and a couple of work sets. And that might be the minimum you need to still get something out of that session. Perhaps if you followed that program to the T, you'd overshoot. And maybe after you warm up, you feel good, and you actually find that you know two or three sets or two or three exercises is what, is what you've got in the bank. And then, you know, you can hit, still hit your MRV, perhaps. But you can see how understanding your parameters, you can make the judgment call. And I usually say to people, make the judgment call once you've warmed up in the gym on the lifting side. Make the judgment call whether or not you need to do that lift that day, or if you do how much, etc. Marrying it up to how you feel from jiu-jitsu. Remember that jiu-jitsu is the priority, and we're trying to fit lifting around that. So how do you calculate then? your own personal MRV. And this is kind of the fun part, because it's kind of up to you, really. It just takes a little bit of tracking and observation, but usually in about four weeks, you can figure this out um, for jujitsu, and anywhere from four to 12 weeks, you can figure it out for your lifting. So let's have a little chat quickly about how to do it for BJJ. So some questions to ask yourself then. How many classes can you take part in a seven-day week without feeling completely battered and beaten up, basically? Can you do seven classes a week? Can you do doubles every day for five days a week? Or can you just do Monday and Wednesday nights? What is the amount of jiu-jitsu that you can do and still recover enough to progress with your jiu-jitsu and keep attendance at a consistent frequency. Very often, you know, when you're new to jiu-jitsu, you usually start at like one or two days a week. And after doing it for a bit, you become somewhat adapted and inoculated to that, and you can do three days a week. This happened with me, and then it crept up over years to four days a week, and then five, and then now it kind of balances out between five and seven days a week. Some of those days are doubles or whatever, right? You might find that over time, your MRV also increases as you get more adapted to the sport. And then on that note, you want to think about what I talked to Andrew Reid on the podcast about, which he made a great point of opening my eyes to, is kind of periodizing your sparring. So at the end of your sparring session, you want to be able to conclude that total 
after all the rounds that you've done, it was about 70% intensity on average. Yeah, five rounds, for example. Rounds one, three, one, one and three and four were kind of a three out of five. Round two was a one out of five. And round five was a four out of five, or whatever it is. And you can kind of grade the intensity of your rolling to keep you at that 70%, because 70% is where the least injuries seem to happen. So based on that, if you could come out of each class at a 70% intensity, how many times a week could you do it? For strength and conditioning, finding your MRV for that, well, if we weren't doing jiu-jitsu, there would be a different method to do it. So when you look at what um, Dr. Mike Isratel has written in his book, How Much Should I Train? They talk about doing hypertrophy, just training hypertrophy, two to five meso cycles or kind of training blocks, if you like. And they talk about training for hypertrophy at a level that you know isn't going to quite push your limits and you slowly increase the volume block to block until you can't recover. And then you make a note at that kind of last block of where you were just on the edge. And then that's how much, you know, that's your kind of MRV figure. But because we're grapplers, it's not necessarily practical to do a muscle building hypertrophy program alongside our training because the very nature of sparring is quite sort of catabolic. It kind of breaks down a lot of that tissue. Unless, again, you're on roids, then it's a different story. But if you're natural, then trying to build muscle and train hard sparring is quite difficult to do. So I wouldn't actually recommend for S&C doing a hypertrophy-based program for a few blocks to figure that out. Instead, what I do to figure out your MRV for your S&C is basically just start at two lifting sessions per seven days, spaced however you need, and just do two or three exercises per session. And we're going to get to exercise selection and stuff in future episodes. Two or three exercises per session and just start there. Again, we'll go down the, the wormhole of programming and sets and reps and rest times to start with. But start there and see, can you do that for four weeks? Can you do that two sessions a week consistently, two or three exercises per session for four weeks and still hit your MRV slash maintenance number of BJJ classes per week? Can you do them both together? And if you can and you feel like you've got more, obviously, add in a bit more. That might be another exercise. That might be more volume on the exercises that you're already doing. You just increase the amount of work slightly and then you can run it again for another four weeks. And you can see over three or four goes of running, the, running this sort of experiment on yourself, you'll get a really good idea of what you can handle in a seven day cycle. Now, of course, this is basically trial and error, informed trial and error. And what's cool is it's going to be unique to you. And you'll find, you know, the days that you slept worse, it's going to be harder the next day. The times you haven't eaten enough food, it's going to be harder for that week or whatever it is. So it's quite a bit of a, of a journey. To quote just Dr. Mike Isratel there on the kind of idea, to kind of close up that idea for testing your MRV for S&C. Fundamentally, we can get a great estimate by simply starting each training cycle with a volume we pretty much know for sure isn't pushing our limits, though it's challenging enough to give us some gains. As the cycle progresses, we slowly increase volume until we're unable to recover. Then we take a deload and then rinse and repeat. Two pieces of great news for this method. First, you find your MRV. And second, that's how you're supposed to be training for hypertrophy anyway. So once you've figured out your MRV for kind of your jiu-jitsu, for your lifting, then you want to do the same with the maintenance, right? So how many BJJ classes can you attend per seven days and not get any worse at BJJ? And then obviously, how much work do you need to do in the gym in order to not get any weaker or detrained? Again, when you start jiu-jitsu, anything, any sessions per week, one session per week, 
is an improvement because you don't have any background in jiu-jitsu. So white belts, you're going to improve whatever your maintenance volume is, whether it's one class a week or 100. You're, you're still going to improve. After blue belt, though, I find that it's kind of, in order to not get any worse at jiu-jitsu, you need to at least do two classes a week to maintain your skills. To progress your skills at a rate that's fulfilling for most seems to be three plus on average from what I've observed and chatted to people and then experienced with myself. So this is the kind of the fun part of the training journey, figuring out your MRV, figuring out your maintenance volume and just getting a rough idea. It doesn't have to be super exact to start with. The more you train, the more you understand the nuance of this. And this, this is a whole wormhole in itself. I mean, MRV and maintenance volume are just a couple of categories that you can measure. There's, there's a lot more and there's a lot more variables. But I just wanted to introduce you to those principles. I think they're very useful. They're quite simple to understand. They're basically your two goalposts, MRV and maintenance volume. And you want to be somewhere in the middle, preferably closer to the MRV end. If you want to know more about these topics specifically and kind of where I've been referencing a lot of the material, uh, you should definitely check out How Much Should I Train by Dr. Mike Isratel um, and Dr. James Hoffman. Chad Wesley Smith from Juggernaut Strength Systems, he's got uh, some great videos on YouTube, especially the exercise selection for BJJ and organizing BJJ and lifting and how strong is strong enough for BJJ. So I'll link that in the show notes on the website, that's movemind.online forward slash podcast dash two. If you want to go straight there, there'll be links for this anyway on how you can get some of those resources. And then if this was useful or you know anyone who might benefit from listening to this episode, then please share it with them and let me know if you found it useful too. This is a great fun part of the journey for S&C mixed with, you know, the BJJ lifestyle. I certainly really enjoy it. I love chatting about it. So if you've got any questions, ping them over. And then the next few episodes, we're going to be going down the wormhole further with periodization and what it means to train versus just working out. And then talking more about exercise selection and the kind of things you actually want to be doing in your lifting time to get the most out of it. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll catch you next time.